Welcome back to Retro Axis. On this episode, I'll be responding to some of your questions and comments about the Atari VCS series. The first question that I've been getting a lot is about the memory and the, and the ability to upgrade the disc. So let's talk quickly about that. In my disassembly video, I had opened up the case and found the memory slots and also the, uh, the, the SATA drive slot where you can expand the memory. Uh, and one of the biggest questions that I've had so far is about the RAM. In other words, how much memory can you put in? What's the maximum? According to the documentation that Atari provided, 32 gigabytes is the maximum uh, size that you're allowed to install. You're also supposed to install RAM in pairs. So that's something that they mentioned in their document. Um, now I noticed that some people have attempted to do mismatch pairs and they have had success with it. Um, but you know, typically when you install memory, you're supposed to install them as matching pairs for a variety of reasons. Uh, so 32 gigs again is the maximum. Now regarding the SSD uh, drive, so I've had a lot of questions about you know, how, what's the maximum drive size or how come you didn't use an NVMe? Uh, what about the standoff underneath the uh, drive itself when you did the installation? Those are all valid questions. So let me begin first with the difference between the SATA and the NVMe. So firstly, when you again review the Atari VCS upgrade guide, they're very specific about saying that this is a, a SATA SSD drive. So they do not support NVMe. I don't know if that's a result of just when they built this machine, NVMe wasn't a standard or if they're trying to reduce costs, but whatever the case, you are uh, to use an, a, a SATA or S-A-T-A, SATA uh, slot. So that is the requirement for that, um, that interface. Now also about the size of the disk, Technically, there's no limit that I'm aware of uh, in terms of how big of an SSD you can insert other than making sure that it doesn't exceed the length of the space given to you inside of the case. Um, the other thing is uh, at the bottom, when I first did the installation and upgrade video, uh, I had a lot of comments about not using a standoff. A standoff is something you typically screw into the motherboard first that allows the, the um, card to sit flat rather than being pressed down. So uh, I know a lot of you have pointed it out that I didn't use a standoff. I actually went back after the video um, and, and added a, a M3 nut below it like a standoff. It's not <laughs> quite a standoff, but it served the same purpose of making sure that that card wasn't bending down and also kept it off the motherboard and that seemed to work pretty well. The disc size itself, the maximum really, you know, it should just be however much you're willing to spend. Again, this is an Atari VCS. It's sort of a, a, a trimmed down PC spec. It's not quite a gaming PC uh, in terms of like an Alienware or some other, uh, you know, high powered machine. So, you know, really it's up to you how much you want to spend upgrading your Atari VCS. So the other questions that I've received, is this upgradable like a PC? So interestingly, this is uh, essentially uses PC uh, technology. So it has an AMD, what's called an APU, which is an accelerated processing unit. And an APU is something that AMD came out with that sort of melded the graphics processor and the CPU into one chip. Um, and so APUs include an AMD uh, X64 or X8664, a 64-bit architecture uh, with a Radeon graphics chip. Uh, and so APUs are interesting in terms of, uh, you know, how they've been used over the years. They've always kind of been designed for laptops and smaller form factor machines. And indeed the VCS shares a lot of technology with laptops and is an Im more of an embedded form factor. Now a, tr a, a much more serious gaming PC or gaming laptop uh, will have a lot more ability to be upgraded. Um, you know, as an example, in a, in a, uh, like an Alienware PC, like a desktop tower form factor, you're going to have a, a much larger motherboard with PCI Express and PCI slots where you can actually, you know, install additional cards. A lot of times the CPUs are removable. On the VCS, the CPU is not removable. So it is essentially soldered onto the board and it is built, in, essentially built into the motherboard. So it is not removable. So you cannot interchange the processor later. Uh, you're sort of stuck with whatever that particular board ships with. So is it upgradable like a PC? Granted, you can upgrade the memory and add the additional uh, SSD into the SATA slot, but I would say it is not like a traditional gaming PC where you can you know, change the graphics card, upgrade you know, other components, add new sound cards. It just doesn't have that capability. So another question I get quite frequently is about the PC mode on the Atari VCS. PC mode allows you to run 
alternative operating systems besides the one that ships with the Atari. Now the Atari does ship with a Linux-based operating system. As I dove in in one of the earlier uh, episodes in this series, we learned that this was an, this is a, a Linux distribution called Apertus. Now as I dug more into what Apertus is, Essentially, it's a Debian-based derivative that's designed for embedded systems. So it has capabilities in there on how you flash the machine. Uh, and we actually noticed that when we saw that you, ha you had two partitions that looked very similar. Um, and essentially, the way it works is it, it upgrades that one partition. And if it doesn't work, it provides a failback. Um, so Apertus is a very highly customized distribution that Atari used to help build their Atari VCS operating system. And they include it on the built-in flash memory of the VCS uh, when it ships from the factory. But PC mode, what it does is it allows you to install Windows 10 or other Linux distributions. I've demonstrated both OpenSUSE, Ubuntu, and Lubuntu on this channel. So I do know that those are capable of running on the Atari VCS. And PC mode with the right setup will allow you to dual boot back and forth between the Atari VCS and uh, an additional operating system of your choosing. The one thing of note is any OS that you choose to install must support the UEFI secure boot. Uh, and that's very important. There may be ways to install other distributions or operating systems that don't support that through side loading, and I'm certain that's a possibility. I just haven't had a chance to experiment with that feature. For example, uh, Laka, um, that's a customized uh, distribution uh, from the folks who make LibRetro and RetroArch um, that essentially is a way to run uh, emulators um, on, your, on your machine and sort of a custom Linux distribution. Now, speaking of emulation, another question that I get quite frequently is, can this run uh, emulations of certain systems? So in a recent episode, I, I demonstrated uh, running both the PlayStation 2 and the GameCube game on the Atari VCS. Now, I didn't do a lot of tuning, and a lot of you said, well, hey, how come you didn't adjust this or make this faster or adjust this, you know, so on and so forth. I really wasn't interested in spending a lot of time uh, doing that testing. I was more interested in just validating would it run these particular games. Um, certainly, we could go back and do more tuning, but the way that my VCS was set up at the time, I was actually using the onboard uh, flash uh, disk in order to, to run. I had blown away the VCS and installed Linux on top of that. Um, and I was having some minor issues with the Ubuntu installation uh, with some of the drivers. One of the drivers uh, was spitting out a bunch of error messages and was filling up the, the log file and causing the system to crash. So I was kind of under pressure to get that video finished so I could go back and actually do a dual boot installation, which I'm, I'm still yet to do. But to answer your question about emulation, um, I did test RetroArch. I was able to run Nintendo Entertainment or NES games. I, I validated Sega Mega Drive or Genesis games. I also ran the PlayStation 2 and the GameCube game with success and everything does work. So with emulation, really remember this is a, this is a PC. Uh, it does have um, you know, specs. So if you think about that when you're pairing things up, you should always make sure that whatever software you plan to run, you have the minimum system requirements uh, that match it. So whatever that system has is basically the performance you'll get. Now I've seen a couple other videos of folks doing emulation on Windows 10. And because Windows 10 supports DirectX, but the Linux OS only has um, OpenGL, by default, um, you know, we really couldn't take advantage of the DirectX capability. So you may actually get better performance uh, potentially on a Windows OS versus a Linux OS, depending on how you have it configured. But again, a lot of that comes down to personal preference and comfort with the operating system. Uh, regarding software titles, another question I get quite frequently is, hey, will this particular game run on the VCS? Or will, you know, can Cyberpunk 2077 run? I've seen videos of people running that. And, or can I run Doom or Quake and so on? The answer is sure, you can. And again, remember your experience with these games and how it performs and how it runs is all going to be determined by the specifications or the minimum requirements of that game. Because the VCS does not have a dedicated graphics card and because the graphics RAM is shared with the system memory, uh, there will be some limitations in terms of memory speed, uh, graphics capabilities, and so on and so forth. I have not been able to figure out how you adjust the VRAM yet. I know that um, typically that's something you do 
in the BIOS, but currently the VCS uh, has a password protected bi uh, BIOS that uh, Atari has set from the factory. And as of right now, we don't know what that password is or how to unlock it. Uh, I'm continuing to monitor the Discord server that Atari has set up for the backers and also looking at Reddit and other places to see if uh, someone comes up with that password or a way to get into that BIOS and make those changes. But I do suspect that they may not even have that as a feature. Um, perhaps there's other ways that we'll learn about in the future on that. Now, specific to my disassembly and my upgrade videos, I made a few mistakes and did a few things that several of you have pointed out, and I want to address those really quickly. So in my upgrade video, I was wearing uh, blue nitrile gloves, um, and I had made a note that, you know, I didn't want to get oils on the chips, that there's a potential for reducing the life of the chip. And while that's not 100% accurate, um, it's sort of just a habit that I've gotten into over the years. A lot of it is not wanting to get thermal paste and things like that on my hands while I'm working and spread it onto other parts of the system. But also uh, just, uh, it's just something I learned about uh, many, many years ago uh, working with PCBs. Um, so again, is it going to reduce the life of your integrated circuit or your other chips in the thing? Probably not. For me, it's just one of these things where I, you know, I picked this up as just a habit many years ago and just continued to do it. So I don't want to give the impression that this is something that you should have to do. As long as you're careful handling your chips and you're not worried about static discharge, um, that's probably the larger risk, uh, more so than getting oil on the chips, is having static electricity damage the chip. Um, I live in a very humid climate, so we don't get a lot of static electricity here, so it's not a huge concern. In fact, I'm wearing a fleece today, so this is prime conditions to, to actually create static electricity, um, but that would be the larger concern. And so if you have an anti-static wrist strap or you take the precautions to discharge uh, your tools and yourself prior to touching any of the chips, you should be fine. Uh, another question that came up was, hey, did you break your VCS? So I know uh, when I was disassembling the unit, I had uh, inadvertently pushed a, uh, a latch off, whereas I could have just lifted it up and I showed uh, that correction later on in that video, uh, but I actually did not break the unit. I actually uh, was able to get the fitting correctly back into the connector and everything is fine. The USB port works. In fact, uh, I had the ROMs uh, USB plugged in on a previous episode and I booted off of it. I've used the controller. USB port works perfectly. Uh, and the same with the Wi-Fi. I know I had knocked out the antenna wire uh, and actually got that back in place and everything is working perfectly fine. I'm able to connect to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, no issues there. So I did not actually break the VCS. So another question I've received is, what do I think of the Atari VCS so far? Uh, well, to be honest, I haven't spent a lot of time actually using it as an Atari VCS. So I need to spend more time in the VCS operating system, playing with the games on the store, experimenting more with the controllers, and really getting to know the real intent of the VCS. Now again, these guys built this system primarily to be you know, a, a console of their own that supports Atari and other you know, third-party uh, games that they want to have released through the VCS store. And I think that's probably the primary use case. But I think they came up with the PC mode as a way to maybe add some more value to the machine and give users the flexibility to do more with it. But you know, honestly, in my opinion, uh, that's not why I buy a gaming console. You know, I, I, in the past, uh, there's been other attempts to run other operating systems on game consoles. I mean, you can go back as far as, you know, um, the PlayStation 2 is, is one great example. There was actually a Linux kit that I actually owned for the PlayStation 2 that came with a, it came with a, a hard drive, a keyboard, a mouse, and a version of Linux on DVD. It was actually a Sony PlayStation Linux. Um, and there was some third party things that could run because remember the PS2 was a MIPS processor. Uh, it was a customized MIPS processor Sony called the Emotion Engine. Um, and it had a lot of really great power and capability. Um, but again, it's one of these things where I bought the console to play games. And while the use case was really cool that you could run a Linux desktop and you know have printer support and be able to browse the internet and all that, uh, at the end of the day, it's like I already had Linux machines and desktops and I really just didn't care about using my game console as a computer. And I sort of feel the same way about the VCS. It's like, this is designed to be a game console. Cool that you can put Linux or Windows on it and maybe run some emulators and do these other things. But I really want to see the VCS come into its own 
and B, a game console. And I, honestly, I don't know if, if the creators of this thing are continuing to focus in that direction. The catalog of software is very small right now and it would really be nice to see a roadmap or a plan or just more about what's coming out on this thing, um, even pre-orders. <laughs> in the Atari store to show and demonstrate what they're doing and what sort of thought leadership they're applying to the game console world, that would be great to see and I'd love to see that happen. So going back to the question of what do I think of the VCS so far, part of the challenge is we now have the PS5 and the Xbox One X. The new game consoles are out, the next gen is here and Atari unfortunately is really behind the curve. I mean I can even go back as far as the PS3 and I can think about the PlayStation 3 with the cell processor and how uh, you know, innovative and unique that was. In fact, I think Sony lost money on every single PS3 that they sold um, because the technology was just so advanced for its time. That's compelling stuff. That's exciting stuff. I mean, it's the same with um, you know, the Sega Dreamcast, which um, you know, had this, uh, what was it, a Hitachi processor in it and it had you know an embedded windows ce and it had a uh, you know gd roms it was it was it, it had just some amazing capabilities in fact i think it was a very underappreciated system for its time it had the vmus in fact i did a, i did a video on the on the dreamcast running netbsd where i talked quite a bit about how innovative the dreamcast was you know it's cool but where's the real innovation with that um you know what i'm not seeing in the vcs is anything other than just a slim down embedded PC. Now, for those people who have Raspberry Pis and are running RetroPie and doing other things, obviously this thing is in a much larger case than a retro uh, than a Raspberry Pi, but I think there are some cool capabilities and use cases that you could use with the Atari VCS. If Atari is going to be successful, they've really got to figure out how to make this thing special. And right now it just doesn't feel all that special. And I really think that Maybe if we give it a few months, once this thing starts getting into the hands of more and more people, and if the developers of games start to publish more and more things to this catalog, then it's something special. And by special, I don't just mean being able to install games, you know, the same games that I can get on other platforms. So not just a bunch of ports. Uh, we need unique games, things that are unique to this system. Um, and that's really where I think uh, this thing should go. So that's it for the questions and comments so far. I hope you've enjoyed this series. I've got a lot more work to do on the Atari VCS and I'm always open to more of your ideas. So please continue to put those down into the comments below. Uh, if you like this series, uh, be sure to give me a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you next time on Retro Axis.